started. I'm going to stand behind you for a moment just because of the, the camera angle. So good evening, everyone. My name is Shannon McGrady, and I'm the Program and Research Coordinator for the Orangeville Public Library. And I'm thrilled to be able to host this panel this evening. Uh, but before I turn it over to our panel, I just want to share just a brief little story because this is a storytelling series after all. So last weekend, I had the privilege of participating in a climate art workshop, and that was hosted by uh, Climate Action in Dufferin, and art artist from Art Therapy here in Orangeville. Uh, we got to learn a little bit about climate change, and then we were all challenged to create climate action heroes, like superheroes. Um, and my daughter actually created a paper bag princess whose superpower was to fly around the world and re recycle garbage to turn into clothing for people. So while the children were busy creating their climate action heroes, the adults in the room got to talk about some of their feelings around climate change and around the climate crisis. And some of the points that came out of that discussion were that many were feeling overwhelmed and they just weren't sure about best practices for going forward. They were concerned that maybe going green wasn't as affordable as they had hoped. Um, and there was just this underlying sense of fear about the future and about our children and their children and, and how you know the climate is going to be for them going forward. So I was reading a quote recently by Howard Zinn. He's a playwright, a historian, and an activist. And he said, we don't have to engage in grand heroic actions to participate in change. Small acts, when multiplied by millions of people, can transform the world. So today we are going to learn how the many small acts our panelists are taking uh, to create powerful change within their homes, within our community, and for our climate. And we'll get to learn from them so that hopefully we can take some of that and put it into practice in our daily lives. So our wonderful moderator, Mark Whitcomb, is going to introduce our panelists very briefly. But I do want to introduce Mark first. So Mark is a botanist, an ecologist, an outdoor education teacher, a naturalist, a member of the Sustainable Orangeville Committee, chair of the Headwaters uh, Nature, which is a local field naturalist club, and he's very passionate about the environment, preserving it and teaching others to do the same. So I couldn't think of a better moderator to host our panel this evening. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Shannon, for organizing it. There are cookies and fruit <laughs> and cookies and fruit and stuff to drink at the back and then all those wonderful books and so on. If you can't hear any of us, uh, tell us so and or move forward. Um, when I taught kids outdoors, it was like being in heaven and getting paid for it. That was my description of my job. And I, I um, basically did that for pretty nearly 40 years in various, in various ways. And two of the really key ideas for me come from Dr. Zeus, the Lorax. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better if not. We have individual actions that we can take in building community that work. And the other was from Rachel Carson, who we're probably most familiar with with writing the Since Silent Spring about the devastation of pesticides in the 1950s. I think that a book that we should actually know at least as well as that is a short little book called A Sense of Wonder, or The Sense of Wonder. And she actually wrote it as a magazine article. Sorry actually wrote it as a magazine article in the 50s, um, making the point that creating or developing or instilling in uh, kids, because she was, that was the context that she was writing that, was the most important. And there are various quotes, if you don't love it, how are you going to save it? How are you going to protect it? What's it going to mean to you? And so my career was devoted to that. I came across, you'll hear lots of quotes to, 
today, but I came across a qu quote earlier this week from a fellow by the name of Alex Steffen, and his um, point was that the most sustainable society is the one which passes forward the best possibilities for future generations, and I think that is at least a reasonable start for a definition of what we're going to learn from these people. And I'm here to learn from these three. In no order other than the geographic order of closeness, <laughs> closeness to me, Heather Peters, um, for the past five or more years, has done an absolutely outstanding job with her family and with others in developing a zero waste lifestyle and a whole lot of other things. Liz Glendy, <coughs> next, I know as a, as a knitter because she's friends with one of my kids who's also a knitter. And, oh, do you know Busy Lizzie? <laughs> she's great. So, Liz lives the lifestyle and, and promotes that as well. And then on the far end is Bruno Zelenga, who started and runs the village refillery down on Mill Street, which is absolutely astounding that that resource and that sense of community that all three of these people are developing is here in Orangeville. And I see some of you from other uh, places as well and with other actions. So this is not just the three of them talking, it's all of us talking. We're gonna start off by each of them giving a somewhere less than half an hour description <laughs> of what brought them <laughs> to this place. It's a lot less. <laughs> 30 seconds? No, anyway. Um, seconds, not and then I'm going to pose some potential questions, inviting them to reframe the questions and take it the way we, they want. And at some point in time, you folks put your hand up and, and ask questions and, and make points as well, although let's maybe let the thing get started here first. Does that make sense? If you don't know where the washrooms are, they're out the door down the hall about 20 steps. And there's the food and the cookies. <laughs> uh, Heather. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, so Mark is right about five years, so we started kind of on a zero waste, near zero waste with our family. But for us, it started a lot sooner than that and for me um, a long much longer time ago than that and you know um, I felt very connected with nature and, and very protective of it since I can't believe I never say I am um, <laughs> since I was as long as I can remember you know and for sure back to at least when I was 12 and uh, for our family it's something that's really important and it's something that we enjoy doing and something that we plan our life around and so while we do try near zero waste, not as well as we were doing before the pandemic, I tell you. Um, we try to take an overall um, approach. We pay attention to the electricity and natural gas that we use. We uh, transport ourselves under our own power and public transportation as much as possible. We do currently own half a car, but we were without a car for about five years. Um, we, you know, do our best for reducing our resources with zero waste. Um, what's coming in as well as what's going out. They're always connected. Uh, our water, and uh, one of my favorite projects at the moment is um, removing all the invasive species from our yard and uh, we've been naturalizing it with native uh, plants, which has really made a big difference to the biodiversity in our yard. Even though we're in downtown Orangeville, you know, it can make a big difference. Um, uh, you know, I know Shannon said, you know, that it's people worry it's more expensive and it's more and I, and I think that we'll get to more details but it's really a wash and some things can cost more and some things can cost less and uh, definitely one of the main ways that we've approached a lot of things is less mm -hmm. 
you know, reduces my favorite of the R's. And um, it works in, in all of the things that we do. We work on sort of reducing um, what we use and therefore reducing our impact. I'm really motivated, you know, definitely by the future. You know, I have two kids and, you know, that's a big thing. But for me, I'm motivated very much by the present. We share this world with, you know, many other creatures and plants outside of humans. And I feel like, I've always felt like I have a duty to them to make sure that, you know, I'm not impacting them any more than necessary. Thank you. Um, the story starts a little bit the same in the time frame, sort of five years for, um, for myself. And um, one of the things that caught me was, we've probably all seen it, the sea turtle with the straw up their nose mm -hmm. that, that was really viral about five years ago. And um, it was just kind of that moment where I went, oh yeah, that's, that's really gross, that's horrible. I think I, I can stop using straws. I don't really use them that much anyway, but you know, I can stop using straws. And then I went, wait a minute. What about Q-tips? What about stir sticks? What about this? What about that? And all of a sudden, I couldn't unsee any of it. All of a sudden, it just every uh, everything just had its place up the nose of an animal or something. It was just that that kind of I just it was my aha moment, I guess. Um, but having said that, and similar to Heather's story, there's been a lot of background with me trying to be uh, more environmentally conscious. A, a high school friend of mine remembers when I got my first apartment that I was the only one in the apartment with a, a blue box. You know, recycling was just starting around that time and and I was, she remembers, and I, I didn't even remember that I did that, but I, I made a point of doing that in my apartment, which wasn't that easy at the time. Um, and I had my very first grocery bag from um, Loblaws. And I still have it. It's like 35 years old now, this cotton grocery bag. And it's a mess, and I use it for firewood now. But, it's, uh, but I still have it. So um, I, I must have been aware on some level, you know, as an, a young adult living on my own and trying to make those choices for myself. So, but anyway, in the past five years, um, I, I don't, I'm no expert, but I'm very happy to share what um, little steps that I've taken. Um, and, and my family, to some degree, I have two adult children, so things are a little different in my house right now, where um, adult children can make their own decisions, and they're not always the decisions that mom would make, so there's always some uh, give and take a little bit. But we're doing our best, um, and uh, when we learn more, we do better, and that's always been the way I'm trying to look at it. Um, a sense of perfection is, really the, uh, what is it, the barrier to uh, progress is the perfection. So um, doing a little bit is better than doing nothing. And when you learn more, you do more. So um, that's sort of where I'm at. Um, and we're happy to have arrived somewhere on the zero waste continuum. Again, it's not an absolute. Um, you can think of it as a continuum. And, and sometimes you're here, and sometimes you have to make a decision that puts you here, and then sometimes here. So um, you, you do your best with every decision that you make. And, and each little decision counts and makes a huge, huge difference. Um, yeah, so I think, um, yeah, the, the last thing I guess that's important to me is that um, when one person does something, there's a ripple effect. So there's that drop of water in the pond and it, and it ripples out. So um, trying to walk the walk in the way that you can will inspire someone else and you may not even know it, right? You're just picking up that little piece of litter and putting it in the trash can in front of someone and they might think, oh gosh, that was great. That really made my day. Now I'm gonna do that and make someone else's day to see that. So little tiny things, little efforts like that, bringing your own cup, this, that, whatever, it, it can, a lot of people will see it and it will make a difference. Yeah. So I think that's all I have to say. Hi, I'm Bruna. I never did this before. So. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I moved to Canada when I was 17. I'm 32, turning 33. Uh, by myself, uh, my family is still there for the most part. They slowly started immigrating once I made it. Sorry, I'm trying to speak louder. Um, Her son is <laughs> waving. <laughs> yeah, sorry if you can't hear me, let me know, okay? Uh, so yeah, and um, 
I guess for me, like I've always been sort of like looking for, you know, uh, what is not okay in the world and especially when it came to the climate because that's something that I grew up in. Um, I lived at, you know, I went from a farm to a beach in Brazil and we just like the lifestyle, we just like lived outdoors and uh, like beach cleanups and things like that were just things that we did normally because if we didn't, we couldn't surf or we couldn't, you know, play at, so at the beach. and. Um, so moving here was a huge, big thing. I wanted to uh, look for better opportunities. Um, Brazil is great, but it's overpopulated. Um, so um, I was, you know, I've, I came here and now I had a family, I have my beautiful boys, and I was trying to find something meaningful to do. I was uh, putting together snowboards, skateboards, just things that I liked doing while living my conscious life. I've worked at health food stores and all that, but I wanted to grow something that was my own, but it needed to have a purpose. Um, you know, I was studying to be a real estate agent and that's wonderful, but it just didn't feel like me. So I just went all in and, you know, probably got myself into some debt. Uh, <laughs> and I opened the Village Refillery because for me, it's like right now, there's not, um, you know, I've always had this thing in me that you need to be doing something to achieve something that's for the better, right, of, you know, society or, um, you know, the environment. So I was like, but I'm old. You know, I'm not going to go and do the things I used to do and, you know, get pepper sprayed or like peacefully, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so in Brazil, a long time ago, so, anyway, I, um, so this is my way of doing something and it's working like it has been like, I mean, we probably went through more things than most little biz, you know, small businesses when they first start out. Uh, we started out during COVID, and then we had a fire, like something. <laughs> um, and uh, so, but uh, anyways, I, uh, in terms of the lifestyle, I've always lived it. You know, we grew up with very little. I don't come from a rich family in Brazil, so from a very young age, you know, my, my grandparents, they would be making do with what we had. So, you know, we'd cut like Coke bottles and we'd make it into soap dishes and we, you know, just little things like that. Um, and I think that, in, you know, and then growing up somewhere that you see so many people with so little and they're so, so happy and they make do with it. Mm -hmm. It really inspires you to, um, yeah, to uh, share that and, um, and I think it's, uh, it's really great. So coming here was a huge lifestyle change for me. Um, I'm still adjusting um, and yeah, it's the Village Refillery is helping me be able to um, continue to live this more easily and then facilitate it for others. And I think we've diverted over like, I don't know, 25, 30,000 bottles from within our community and beyond, you know, our garbage gets sent send off to other countries even. So uh, it's pretty good. We have people that come in with the same bottle that they first, from <laughs> when we first opened. And same dish, so plastic bottle, you know, that imagine how many they would have gone mm -hmm. through. So, yeah. So they've answered the first three questions, <laughs> which is wonderful. Sorry. <laughs> I would like to, and you alluded to it about the affordability of all of of all of these lifestyle actions. I'd like you to talk more about that. Um, there are some things we definitely spend more money on, I'm guessing, than the average person, and food may be one of them. It's difficult to say because some things are more expensive, some things are less, right? You know, refilling and buying in bulk at the Builder Filler or a bulk barn or other places like that is often less expensive. Um, you know, it's difficult to say, you know, an organic CSA is probably going to work out to be more expensive than if you buy your standard produce at the grocery store. Maybe not if you buy the organic grocery store produce. So it goes back and forth. But for me, the savings is not is in just as I said before less, right? Our family of four, I can wash all of our clothes for a week in one load. 
and because we don't, you know, we don't have very much. So even if we were to spend a little bit more on some of our clothes, we have much less of them. Mm -hmm. Everything else as well, we just, when, we, when I went zero waste, one of the first, you know, people started saying, oh, what are you doing for the, this or what are you doing for that? And I wasn't very helpful because what I found is that I just stopped buying lots of stuff and I just didn't use replacements for a lot of things. So, you know, we have very minimal toiletries. We have shampoo bar and soap and coconut oil and that probably covers our entire toothpaste. Mm -hmm. That probably covers our entire bathroom, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, sort of toiletries. Uh, and so the, le the less portion has made it very affordable for us. Even if some aspects might have increased a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, I completely agree with what, what Heather's saying. And, and um, to add to that, I think that um, being zero waste has also made me a much more mindful consumer. So in that sense, you, there's, you can't help but save money. Because when you think about, oh, am I gonna just order this thing off Amazon that's all shiny? Well, A, I, I never shop on Amazon, but I, I rarely order online. But they think, well, there's all the gas, and then, oh my gosh, the shipping, and what's it gonna come in? Am I gonna have to deal with all that bubble wrap and, and all these things? So all of those things factor in, because I don't wanna deal with that anymore. That stuff is primarily not in my house anymore. So for me, it's an easy decision to say, no, I don't need that shiny thing. Or can I find that shiny thing on Marketplace where someone else wants to get rid of it and I can drive five minutes to get it? And um, that kind of thing. So um, for me, a lot of the cost and the affordability comes from um, the way I mindfully shop now is I start with, do I actually really, really need it? Um, first of all, at all. And then um, can I find it secondhand if I really do need it? Um, most of the time the answer is yes, I'm shopping for a speaker right now and I'm even shopping for a specific brand that I need or, or want to use and um, I'm finding tons of options on Marketplace. So uh, there's that. Um, it's not a knee-jerk reaction just to buy what you need. It's all of a sudden becomes a process. So um, and then the other thing is can I borrow it? Right? When you borrow things, if, if, if you need, you know, I, I need a wheelbarrow twice a year, I'm not a gardener. <laughs> so if I go to my neighbor and I knock on the door and twice a year, I, I borrow a wheelbarrow instead of buying one. You know, they're usually big and disgusting and plastic now, right? Um, so it, it, so all of those things make a lower waste lifestyle so much more affordable um, just by being a mindful consumer. Uh, well, and I'd like to say, the borrowing, I think is super important as well because it is community building. It's a really small way, but it is, right? Like Absolutely. you're more likely to, you know, get to know your neighbor or at least reach out to someone in your neighborhood more often if you have things that you are kind of trading back and forth and I think yeah, that's a sure. really important social aspect of it. Yeah. And, and teaching you know, your neighbor may not think the same way, so I think by exchanging it. Yeah. They feel comfortable asking for you. So, yeah. yeah so. so I don't find it more expensive overall. I mean, some some things, yes, but on the on the whole, absolutely not. If you go out and you think, okay, zero waste means I have to have the fancy coffee cup and the fancy water bottle and then the set of this and the set of that, the, 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 and you go and you buy all that stuff at once, it's going to be expensive. <laughs> but if you look and say, what have I got that I can already use and all that stuff, you can make a whole lot of changes before and then develop those habits and then bolster them up with some things that may be kind of fun and, 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 and pretty or whatever. And you know, you can use that as a, a reward or whatever. I'm going to bring my old, my, my utensils from home and, and if I lose them, there's a thrift store. I could buy more utensils, right? Mm -hmm. So that kind of thing. So I just say that that's the thing. Don't throw out all your plastic and go buy all metal tiffin tins. That's expensive. That's why people get the idea it's expensive. It's the Instagram version of zero waste that's really expensive. But the right? version isn't pretty. No, <laughs> <laughs> it ain't pretty. But isn't it also counterintuitive then? Because you're disposing of stuff that is yes. perfectly usable exactly. to bring in more stuff. That's right, exactly. So you, that's not a zero waste approach like that. It was, I think, back in, the, in 2018, 2019, when I was first kind of looking into this, there was a lot of that really, you know, pretty jars with the little labels and the pantry and everything was all just so beautiful. And um, uh, yeah, 
My, mine is a assortment of thrift store jars and um, jars that I pick up at uh, the refillery when I forget one or find something else I want to buy and I didn't bring in enough jars. Whatever, it's it's very it's peanut butter jars, it's whatever. So it doesn't matter. And then, um, you know, if I see a cute one in the thrift store, yeah, I'm grabbing that. But um, but for, you know, you don't need to do that right away. So mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah. Well, basically everything you yeah. said. And then, um, yeah, I think that we have just, I think that's what society has been taught, you know, over years and years is just, well, it's, it's um, that we need all these things. It's just, uh, I think that it's becoming, it's become very overwhelming in every aspect. So, um, yeah, I do think that the biggest thing is just realizing that you don't, uh, making do with what you already have, even if it doesn't look pretty. Uh, maybe one day you'll be rich and then you'll look beautiful everywhere. <laughs> um, sorry, because it does cost money. So anyways, but if you shop at the refillery, for example, um, I do think that, it, or bulk barn, I do think that things can be more affordable. Um, also because you get to just take as much as, as your family and yourself actually need, which avoids food waste. Um, another important thing and just product waste um, and then yeah you pay per gram and per weight so a lot of things the volume is very light so you don't pay a lot for the product um, and then besides the fact that you know they are concentrated products so a little bit goes a long way something to consider when buying products that you know you don't want them to be diluted with water they will not just not work so well but also be uh, you're going to be going through it so often. Um, yeah, so I think that those are the changes that you can make. It's just realize that you don't need all the stuff that we're being told repeatedly. Um, and I, But I do see a light at the end of the tunnel, and I think that people are starting to realize and uh, make those changes. Transportation. You've got half a car. Is it a front wheel drive? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have half a car. We also have half a house. So when I say we went for less of everything, we really went for less of everything. My parents have uh, actually a swanky apartment in the basement. It's nicer than our upstairs. <laughs> um, and we own half the house with them, and we own half the car with them. And so I took the bus here today because my parents are visiting my sister. Um, so we, certainly in the nice weather, we walk most places. My kids walk to, I think, all of their activities uh, or bike. Um, right now, the Orangeville bus system is free. If anyone didn't know, it's on a two-year trial. And uh, I took the bus here for free. And um, you talk about borrowing. One of the things I admit that I do borrow sometimes, for sure, is uh, I have a few good friends that, you know, I borrow their car. and. They borrow other things if it's just like a little short trip where it's really needed. But for the most part, and, and even before this, until my parents moved in, we were without a car for five years and we'd rent and we leave town. But otherwise, we'd get ourselves where we needed to go. And I admit that I love walking and biking somewhere because you can't make yourself rushed. Well, I suppose you can, but <laughs> I'm less likely to. I'm less likely to because I know that I don't want to be like, oh my gosh, I have to bike faster. Right? And, uh, you don't want to have to guess like how good my cardiovascular fitness is. <laughs> so I always leave myself more buffer. When I drive somewhere, I like cut it right mm -hmm. close and then I get there and then you're like, oh my gosh. And then it's like, if I bike somewhere, I leave myself extra time. I've got all those nice exercise endorphins when I get somewhere. I feel good and happy. And so I love transporting under my own power as much as possible. Part of the families. Heather's family's actions on that were the establishment of the bike routes around town and the deliberate, I'm going to put it as the deliberate involvement of Grant on town council to present options like that bike route. So this is a family project, not just one person project. Um, and I can speak to the borrowing of, of space because Grant's election signs were in my garage. <laughs> 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 I don't have a garage. <laughs> but they're not there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, Would you like me to for yeah, transportation? Transport, okay. Sorry, exactly. So, yeah, transportation. So um, we live uh, just inside or just outside of Orangeville in Mono. So unfortunately, public transit isn't an option, nor is walking at certain times of years. And um, uh, I. I did get a much nicer bicycle and um, planning to use that more this year, which is why I'm buying a smaller speaker because I'm a fitness instructor and I want to lug my big giant speaker when I cycle to class. So there we go. Anyways, <laughs> circling back to that. But anyways, uh, so we do have vehicles. So we, right, we at the moment we have four adults in our house and only two working vehicles, which can be a, a challenge. Um, so that's another reason I want to try my bike. Um, vehicles. We have a 2015 used car car we bought used um, that uh, is our sort of larger fit everything in it car and um, a 2008 Honda Fit which we got used from a little old lady don't tell my mother I said that <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah so that's those are our current vehicles right now so um, we are currently researching um, electronic or hybrid vehicles to be able to pass our 2007 Honda Fit to my daughter so that she'll have something for work and whatnot. So we're just looking into that and doing some research on, on EV or hybrid possibilities. That's what I would like to do for our next vehicle. So uh, it's always a learning curve. For us, the vehicles thing is a bit of a learning curve and uh, we're, st we're still working on it, but um, we have committed to buying only used vehicles as part of that. That's the best we can do right now. And so we're doing the best when we learn more. Um, so I just started driving about four years ago or so. I'm a little delayed. Um, that was one of the first things that I always said since I was a young girl is that I would never drive. But, you know, I moved out of Toronto a few years ago and I lived down there for six years, never needed to, to drive. And then being in Orangeville and then having kids, I had to give in and, and I think it's a good thing to be able to uh, but I used to live right on 2nd Street so that was super easy I could just walk to everywhere and bike and even after I started driving because before I used to walk everywhere in Orangeville uh, but now I kind of made a sacrifice um, I moved out of Orangeville it's a little bit further about 20 25 minutes so when I'm not at work I'm a hermit um, literally because I have an earth uh, dome thing so and it's like in the hill um, so, an off -grid home. <laughs> yeah yeah it's really great so I don't really want to leave my house um, but yeah, it's uh, it's a bit of a you know you exchange things. Um, it's harder, but um, and I just drive less. Kind of about the same, I guess, as before. If I just stay there when I'm not working, uh, I am trying to get an electric vehicle. My vehicle is uh, like a Subaru. I really like Japanese things, and I really like Subarus. And uh, I've been waiting for them to make an electric one, but I don't know if it's going to happen. And I don't want to get a new one. I like used vehicles. So, anyways, I'm working on the electric. But I think that you know, it's it's that thing in life. Like you, you do as much as you can when you can. Um, I'm doing something else right now. That's what I can do. It's the same saying, like you don't don't throw out all your plastic containers under the yeah. balance. Your cars mm -hmm. are still working, right? Absolutely. I think people forget kind of the embodied energy and making something new, right? My that new thing, like all the manufacturing, the mining, everything. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. If you have something that's already working, you don't have to. My car's paid off next year. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Like if I borrow a friend's car? Like, no. Oh, like no. my... With your parents, so... We co in the car. They're on the insurance. So you're both liable. So there, it's just two different families on the same insurance for the same car. You can put as many people on your insurance. It's the same as like adding your kids to your insurance. Okay. Oh. You just add extra drivers. So that's it? Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm not sure if it, I don't... I think you have to be in the same household. 
for it to work. If one is not in the same household. If one is not in the same household, I'm not sure. You're not an insurance broker. I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, I know that you are, like when I have insurance, if someone else is driving my car, then the insurance still covers it. But if you have to read your fine print, it's usually like, they can't drive your car more than a certain number of, okay. it is meant for casual, that general insurance yeah. is meant for casual. So I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. How do you present choices to yourself, to other adults, and to kids, and bring it to customers? Uh, um, we've been getting really involved with the youth, especially in Orangeville and Calden surrounding areas. We've been going to schools and uh, talking to them about what we do and why from grade uh, like junior kindergarten to grade four so far um, and it's great like they're super into it they'll talk about you know if their parents do it I may have slipped a little you know like card in there and uh, you know attracting more people to do it because it is necessary at this time so we're getting involved by I think that just like when you care and you're making a change in your community you, know, you naturally connect with people because they want to see the same so uh, people have been just we've been connecting and sharing and uh, the schools are a big target for me. My kids, you know, I started in their classes and slowly started being like, hey, hi, teacher, do you want me to come speak? And so yeah, it's, they've been, yeah, it's been good. I love kids. It's awesome. Does that answer anything? Okay. <laughs> How do you present choices? Um, so first, I guess walk the walk and the best way you can and just be an example um, you know again with my perspective of having my adult children moving back home it's different I, I don't get to be the full boss anymore <laughs> in some ways I mean I'm still the boss of the house in a way but not always so um, things creep in but um, you know just try and focus on my own choices I've got to focus on what I can change and um, not worry as much about the others, because that sent me down a really bad spiral for a while. I think Heather talked me out of that. <laughs> talked me off a ledge, off an eco ledge one day. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was really, really good. Um, but yes, so so do you know? Walk the walk. Um, stay in your lane. Like try and do what you can do for you first, and um, and then you know wait for the ripples. The ripples will happen. Um, and as far as in public, I'm pretty. I'm pretty matter of fact about my choices too. Like um, I think of an example when uh, my son was younger and he was in a musical theater production. They were doing a little um, performance at the town hall in the circle at the farmer's market. And, um, and um, my son came over and he said, I don't know what to do, mom. This lady just gave me a water bottle. Because <laughs> I was at my booth at the market. He goes, I don't know what to do. I said, have you opened it? And he said, no. And I said, okay, let's just go and give it back to her and say thank you. And um, I'll give you a cup. I had a, a jar behind my booth, and I said, I'll give you a jar. You can go into the, um, the town hall and fill up your jar in the water fountain. And so um, we just took that opportunity to just connect and say, thank you so much for offering him the water, but he doesn't need it. And she said, oh, no, no, it's free. I gave it to him. I said, no, no, it's just that we don't use plastic water bottles in our house. It's just something that we're trying to um, work on in our house is to reduce our plastic. And so um, um, she's like, oh, it was just so hot. I thought it would be a good idea, but oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's kind of so. Anyways, it was good. It was a pleasant interaction. I, it, there was no judgment or anything. So try not to be judgy, but I'm just matter of fact about what what goes on. And and if there's a moment where we can connect with someone and have a conversation, that's the best thing that you can do. Um, and that's what I try and do in, in my um, my booth when I'm at Busy Lizzie Boutique at the market. Um, a lot of what I have is, is sustainable um, swaps for things that you would otherwise throw out. And so if it creates a conversation and people get ideas, that's what really gets me excited. So, yeah. Um, for choices for myself, I guess I just try to look bigger picture. You know, certainly if you're buying something, what's the end use? You know, if I have enough, you know, two options, you know, which is lower impact, and, and I, you know, and no, no one's perfect, but I try to pick the better of those options. Um, 
because it's so ingrained in our household, my kids have sort of grown up with it, and they're overall pretty good with it. They're 12 and 14, and I know you say, like, you don't get to control your kids anymore. I feel like I don't really get to control my kids anymore either. Um, they're at an age where we're really trying to let them make their own decisions, even if we don't always love them. Um, love or the decisions. Decisions. <laughs> decisions. We love the children. Yeah. Very fair. Um, publicly, you know, sometimes people notice, right? If you bring your own dishes to a pancake breakfast, mm -hmm. people are like, oh. Or if you go to Dave the Butcher and you bring your crock pot bottom and they watch them put the whole chicken in there for you. <laughs> <laughs> and you take it home, you don't even take it out. You get to cook it right away. Right? <laughs> Say that again, because that's yeah. just revelatory. <laughs> so when I go to Dave the Butcher, I bring what I'm going to cook the meat in. And I give it to them and put it on the scale and they all like, they're pros now, they all know what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of like, at the start of this at different places, there's a lot of teaching people how to use the tear function, but you know, most everyone's got it down. And, and yeah. And uh, that chicken will be $934. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you know they got it wrong. That's when you know they got it wrong. But yeah, I bring whatever I'm gonna cook the meat in. Or sometimes I you know, store if I'm gonna get ground beef or something. And they tear it and they just put it directly in there. And that's how I take it home. And then I cook it right from there. That's one of the great things about going to the village of Philly or Black Barn, right? I take the container I'm going to store it in. Yes. And then I don't have to guess how much I need when I get there. I'm not looking at it in a plastic bag going, yeah. yes. <laughs> so and yes. And in terms of affordability, we forgot to mention that you also don't get to, you don't pay for the packaging, right? Yeah. Which is yeah. a huge thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you have yet any luck at all with uh, traditional grocery stores doing anything like that? So pre-COVID, mm -hmm. yes. um, I could go to Zares and I could go to the deli yeah. and I could give them whatever container and say, I want this many slices of ham. And they'd say, oh, I don't know if we do that. And you say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You do it for me all the time. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> and if you act like it's okay and totally normal, but people usually just go with it. Um, Do not ask permission. No. <laughs> and uh, see the cheese, so I had cheese cut like that. I admit that I, over COVID, found other uses and other things, um, so I haven't tried post-COVID, but you know, they did get rid of their entire uh, bulk section, so yeah. you know, I wouldn't. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, there's still some over um, overreach in terms of COVID. I, I found that out when I went to a meeting at, at Tim Hortons and I brought my cup and I said, can you fill my cup? And they said, yes. And I went, oh, awesome. And they promptly poured the coffee in a paper oh, cup, yes. put it in my cup and tossed the cup in the garbage. I literally shrieked. Oh. <laughs> wow, dude! What are you doing? And he said, he said, I have to. This is, we can't, we're not allowed to pour it right in the cup. I'm trying to picture that. What about this <laughs> is causing any? I don't understand. I think the education needs to come. Uh, from so, yeah, yeah. So yeah. That it is, so it's not always easy, and it's not across the board. You know, no. booster juice here will not let you use your own container. Yep. Oh, but yeah. booster juice in Georgetown will. Oh. But Euphoria will, and yes. so will Mo uh, Bubble Mocha. Oh, oh the will they? Because they didn't Mary. used to. Really? The I took my place. almond butter <laughs> jar. They will now? <laughs> oh, good. They changed. <laughs> it's good to know these things. Deja Vu will give you your stuff in your own container if you bring it. Like if you order and you bring your own containers to Deja Vu, they'll put it in whatever you want and take it. You can take, take out. Yeah. Um, so will um, Forge. Uh, so will Auntie Joy's. So Auntie will uh, Curry Mantra. Curry Mantra. Curry Mantra has their own has containers. Their own they have like steel a little yeah. container. I think it's super. Yeah. So there's lots of <laughs> lots of places. Lots of places you can do these little things. Grocery I'm going to do a tip sheet, by the way. Yeah. I am going to follow up. It all <laughs> and right? I, I missed half of those, so I will circle back, <laughs> yeah. and then I'll put them on the tip sheet for everyone, and, and I'll email that saying. out. Just, but just ask, and act yeah. like it's normal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And most places will let you. A container question, because I thought we are kind of talking containers. So I haven't been to the village of Blurry yet, but I really like to. Um, so if I walk in with a tight <laughs> That's great. I love it. Yeah, that we take anything. It okay. can be so an old yeah. yeah. Actually, <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that because that's one of the things that I probably would have done thinking forward is I would have saved my last one. 
I got four. So, well, there you go. But I'm, I'm good now. I did I did reclaim one from my, my mother-in-law. So, but um, but I would have re sort of saved my last of whatever handy plastic bottles because you know they're very durable. Yeah. Like you can use them for a very very long time. Um, and yeah. So what I was doing when I first did the zero waste and was very, very proud of myself every time one thing went into the recycling or the garbage and then I never had to buy it again. And it was literally that. It was like, I never have to buy mustard in a plastic bottle again. And I took a picture at my recycling bin and I went, <laughs> and now these are coming up on my feed going, four years ago you did this and five years ago you did that. And it's really fun because it gives you some accountability and some excitement. Like, how many mustard bottles have I saved? Right? It's a lot. How do you buy your mustard? Um, I tried making it for a while. That did not go over well with everybody else. Not been yeah, not been successful with mustard. But um, I just buy it in glass containers and I, I tend, you can find uh, the same French's mustard or whatever in glass. You just have to look a little harder. It's usually on the same but it's down low because it's not where people buy it. On the, it's, so we find glass, ketchup, glass, mustard, glass, whatever. Um, oh, and I've successfully made ketchup. Yeah. Oh, no, oh I need your recipe. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, things like that. So every time I would put something in. But um, my dish soap, I really I think that's the picture that I shared for, for the social media. I probably would have saved that last one because I don't love using glass for my dish soap. It's better to squish it. Yeah, so I probably would have saved that, but um, yeah. We can start <laughs> refilling mustard, I know that. Yeah? Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Refill mustard, I meant. <laughs> yeah. You, you refill mustard? Not oh. yet, sorry, oh. but we could. It's oh. an option. Yeah, yeah, we refill all of like, oils Mustard and, and ketchup, I'd be in. Mm -hmm. I'd be in, well, unless I can find a really good recipe. Ketchup. <laughs> <laughs> but I did, actually, I did go to um, a Dan Deja Vu Diner. Very nice. Jennifer's a wonderful yeah. soul. Um, and I was in there with my little um, knitting and crochet group the other day, and I said, you know, I'm having a problem with the ketchup because the little glass bottles, we go through them too fast, and they're kind of expensive, and you still have to recycle the glass bottle, which is not the best. I'd rather refill if I can refill rather than recycle. And um, I said, can you get me like the big tin from the restaurant? And apparently she, she couldn't, I had to buy six or something. I wasn't quite willing to do that. So she said, just bring in your bottle. I'll, I'll refill it for you. That's so awesome. last time I went there, she just she just charged me, I don't know, four or five bucks or something to refill my ketchup bottle. That is how we got our ketchup as kids. In, like in the, the, big, the, 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 the can. For our kids who put right? ketchup on everything. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so there's always it's it's a very creative process. It's I, I find it fun mm -hmm. to think of oh, no, how can I do this? Mustard, you know? <laughs> whatever. And it's like shampoo, whatever. I mean it just it's it's fun. Just look at it as a fun creative adventure. <laughs> how do go ahead. It's an energy question. I just found out recently that a dishwasher is more energy efficient than washing dishes. I don't know if it's more energy efficient, it's more water efficient for sure. So I'm single. I don't have a lot of dishes. Yeah. So I th I, I'm proud of myself for washing the dishes. <laughs> and I've been told. Same yeah. in the dishwasher. I you would have to possibly. Do you have a half load function on your dishwasher? I do. Yeah. So it might work out to be less if you were to just. Or just do once every five days. If you have enough dishes. Yeah. I actually think okay. the dishwashers with the stainless steel interiors are using the stainless steel to keep the heat in. Yeah. So it's actually not heating the water the way that it's used to. And they're very, very energy efficient yeah. now. And the amount of water they're using is minimal. And I've That's actually it. heard yeah. that stat mm -hmm. as well. But I definitely know that I've tried and I cannot wash the same amount of dishes in less water. Yes. Including like the power, the heating, the water, that's everything. So I haven't, okay. I haven't compared that, but I literally just tried right. to wash like a full dishwasher full of dishes in the amount of water that the set a cycle ran, and I could not do oh, it. Yes. Oh, you can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> a good option too is if you save water from like water, water well, your plants and things like yeah. that, uh -huh. then you can use that water to wash your dishes. I do that. I really want a dishwasher, but I don't have enough energy <laughs> to even have, oh. even if it's energy right. efficient. It's, yeah. I don't think I could. Yeah. Well, so, but you're recycling your gray water in your house. I so that's am, a yes. completely so different thing. I think yeah. okay. we're okay. I say I want it, but we don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. I 
Iya. 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 You do a fabulous job online of spreading awareness about the cost efficiency of using bulk products. Like there was one where you compared the dried mangoes, yeah, um, and it was just phenomenal because it really does put it into perspective in a 60 second kind of video yeah. on how easy and how price conscious you actually can be. Yeah. So I just wanted to say thank, thank you, you because it was really yeah. the videos are very informative. Thank you, and it's good to know that it works. So, yeah, <laughs> we're not just wasting our time. No. <laughs> you have a strong social media presence. Thank you. Thank you. Which leads me to the next question, and that is, uh, since people, individuals and people collectively can make the difference, how do you build and can connect communities? And if it sounds like you're answering the same question over and over again, that's good. <laughs> because you're operating from a position and a viewpoint and a, an action orientation that, that ties things together. So how do you build and connect communities? And I'm going to then ask that same question of you people. So think about it. I wrote a very short sentence because I prepared that answer. <laughs> I said, like this! <laughs> and I said, just amplifying your voice when you have the opportunity. And um, inviting others to amplify theirs. That's kind of where I went with that. I've seen you do that at the market. Yeah. <laughs> I've got talk zero waste ideas for, like, talk your ear off. A little bit. Like that's why I like being at the market and having my having that opportunity because it's about the conversations just as much as it is. I mean, it's great that people buy product. It helps me buy groceries. But <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I really want to have those conversations. It's amazing to be out in the community, to be joining things in the community. Um, I find certainly walking everywhere keeps me more connected to my community. The number of times I stop and chat with people that I would never know were there if I was driving my car. Mm -hmm. um, certainly going to the farmer's market, you know, it's a community there. It's the same group of people that are going all the time and even just by going there for your shopping, you are getting to know them better and, you know, talking about different things, finding out you have something in, in common or maybe something to borrow. Um. <laughs> if you see a kid's wagon, you know, with the wooden slats on the side at the farmer's market. Oh no, it's a cloth, and I don't know if I can save it. Mm. Wheels are so rusted. I've been bundle bucking and backpacking. Okay. I know. <laughs> I have a plastic one we don't use anymore. We have it. I know. The, the key with mine is that it folds up, though. Because, oh, I don't have a garage, and I only have a small shed which I'm sharing as well. I guess I only own half the shed as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. um, yeah, I guess I kind of already answered that, but um, just uh, I feel like people really value what we're doing in the community, so they're happy to support. Um, and then that way we support each other and because we're learning from each other in this journey, you know, with the being low waste. Zero waste is great, but it may not be achievable for most at this time in society. So low waste. Um, yeah, so I think that it, it's just being so great because I've been a part of the community for a long time now, but I think, yeah, over 10 years. but. I, and I worked at a health food store, so I kind of knew that there was, you know, there were people that were into all of that healthier, better things for us, for the earth. But it wasn't until I started this that I really got to know, like, how many caring people there are. And uh, I've been getting to know a lot more because I'm being introduced and, like, I'm here. And so I think that's definitely connecting the community. So the question for you is how do you find and how do you join and how do you build and promote communities to involve you in this more sustainable lifestyle? 
So my husband is spearheading the newest plant for Magna and they're building uh, components for electrical vehicles and it's one of the most state-of-the-art facilities in the north end of Brampton. So we are super proud that he is is doing this and it's because he kind of sees what we're doing and he knows that this is the way of the future. Um, they've just done a huge media release through Magna International where there was uh, you know, people from all walks of life and media there taking pictures. They had the new Ford Lightning which is an EV truck and unfortunately it does cost about $120,000. But by spreading that awareness and bringing people together and talking about how we can make it more accessible for everybody, I think forms community. I'm going to completely dispute that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think, I think cars are a scourge, and I think, well, I don't want to say they should be outlawed, but they, their use should be minimized, because we're talking about sustainable living here and, and you know, affordability and reducing costs, and here's a new, a new truck, which the, you know, the mines in Africa or South America are extracting how many minerals to, to make a $120,000 vehicle. Who can afford them? So no, and I actually so I cool, but no, 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 I couldn't agree more. I quit my job so that I could walk to work now yeah. on a daily basis yeah. because my vehicle was at the point where if I was to commu continue commuting, do I trade it in? Do I buy something new? No, let's just you know reduce my salary and then save the money on buying an extra car. So now I do walk into work. We did buy some electric scooters because uh, sometimes it's not always that nice out and you can't always walk to work, um, but. We're trying to make those conscious decisions. Um, yes, there are lots of negatives to electric vehicles that a lot of people are not aware of, and the mining is one of them. And there's a lot going up northern Ontario as well. Um, and so there's uh, some politics that are involved there yes. as well. But I mean, I line dry my clothes. I post pictures about it on social media so people can see that. I can my own food a lot as much as possible. Um, and I think maybe taking us back to the way our grandparents were, were raised and how they appreciated what they had and took full advantage of it, but making it more okay, mm -hmm. you know? So to go, I have to continue my thoughts, sorry. <laughs> um, but to go along with, with that though, I think though, like Heather said, just to go and walk. Because when you're in a car, you're isolated, you're by yourself, you don't yeah. meet people, you don't chat with people. Um, my girlfriend, who goes to Go Yoga on Broadway, uh, I, I walked with her, because we live on McCarthy Street, so we're very fortunate to be able to walk to downtown Orangeville. Um, I walked with her on Thursday or Wednesday, today's Thursday, so it would have been probably yesterday or Tuesday, anyway. Um, on the way back, I was just chatting with people that I see, you know, working on their lawns or just out for a walk. I can chat with people, I can get that interaction. So I think that's one of the best ways to build community is just to talk to people. Yeah. And yeah. for a sort of you know future consideration, hopefully that the uh, town council maybe can somehow make pedestrian safety uh, a bigger issue because some some of the some of the things I have my life in my hands. Yeah. 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 Our biking, yeah. biking, biking is oh not scary. Oh my gosh, yeah. it is horrendous. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm somewhere in between on the electric vehicles, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think everyone should just be I you know switching out the vehicle and we should have the exact same number of cars. It's not going to work with the same number of cars, but we we there's big changes that have to be made to infrastructure if we don't want everyone driving, because we're still building, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. as if everyone should have a car, yeah. Yeah. and everyone should be in their car yeah. all the time. Yeah. And as people yeah. who walk and bike and don't use their car, you know that it's not as safe as it could be, by any means, and it's definitely not as easy as it could be, right? Well, I, I said, like the two of us on the panel are landlocked, right? Yeah. You can't get into town without a car. Once yeah. you're in town, you're kind of okay, but... I used to be sad, yeah. but you know, I'm but also complete, like, I'm fully solar powered for pretty much the most part. We have a small little uh, tank there that we use for hot water, um, and but it's in a little bit of... Uh, in the winter, we have this panel that's supposed to help heat up the house, but it doesn't really work. <laughs> so we just use the <laughs> wood fire, and uh, yeah, like it's just uh, changes, right? Like I avoid driving as much as I can. And I think that speaks to a, a larger issue with um, lower waste and sustainability is that um, those of us who are trying to do this are sort of salmon swimming upstream. Like we're, our society is not built for um, a plastic free grocery shopping trip right now. 
So we have to make a lot of effort to avoid that. Same with what you're saying. We're not built like our, we're just not built to have communities where people can be car free. Um, it's uh, you know I'm not jumping in my car just to have a drive around. My son does, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, it's it's you know, I'm gonna go here, 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 and here, make one trip, and then I won't take the car out tomorrow because I don't need to go anywhere. That kind of thing. So we compartmentalize and do what we can. But we're living in a society that doesn't really support that yet. So there's this whole thing where we're doing what we can from down here, but we have to work on what's going on up there and somewhere we have to meet in the middle so that that's available to everybody and it's easy and it's convenient and it works. You but know we, that. Yeah. How, how do we do that? Because I, like, I agree with you that it's like us versus them. We wouldn't have to pick up <laughs> pollution and garbage from our natural sites if people weren't putting it there. So how do we get the guys that are doing it to think the way we want them, to think the way they should think? Bottom it's up, good. top down, right? I it's, agree. It's, it's voting, policy making, um, leaning on the companies. Um, now that I've got some of these other things going on, like lower waste and um, reduction of con consumption and um, um, eating more for the planet, uh, planetary diet, whatever. Um, now I'm thinking more towards the other thing. So I'm doing more letter writing, more um, uh, signing petitions, um, uh, trying to vote where, with my conscience and not just strategically, <laughs> which is really hard sometimes. But um, that kind of thing. So I think it's all of that. There's no one solution for me. Well, Rooney, you mentioned that you're visiting schools. Yeah. I think yeah. the kids, the younger grades, get it. <laughs> they seem to lose it when they get to high school mm -hmm. and they don't pick it up again until yeah, yeah. they're raising their own families I'd love to and to teach their kids. It's, How do we yeah, get that down? I'd be a bit scared. <laughs> it's, also, it's also a product of the, the way that they were brought up. I mean, when I think back, and I'm, I'm old, but you would never bring a cup of coffee with you anywhere you went. And now there's this whole coffee culture, and now there's all these this waste from this coffee culture. And so now we're trying to just sway that, where at least bring your own damn cup. <laughs> just don't go to him, Tim Hortons, if you want to do that, <laughs> apparently. But um, it, it, so we, we're just kind of making this, like, I think there's, they just grew up with it, and they didn't even, the, the disposable culture started, what, in the in the 70s, 80s? Started 80s to be, plastic. 80s, plastic was much more, and then it's like, oh, we'd buy this disposable thing, and this disposable thing, it'll make your life so much easier. It's all a bill of goods. <laughs> Question at the, the very back. Oh, I was just going to say, I forget what the last thing that one of you was saying. It was, was about community. I, I tell my kids that every, and my husband, that mm -hmm. everything we buy is a vote. Yes. Meaning like, you know, if yes. you order something on Amazon, you're, they're you're saying, going, they're like, oh, but you know, as a vote, then they're going to make Amazon. another one. Yep. Because you bought it, you voted that that's what we want. Yep. So I'm like, you know, think Absolutely. about everything mm -hmm. you're buying in the grocery store and yeah. Yeah. And, and not only, so I, taking it one step further, everything you buy is a vote, but then you can also write a letter. <laughs> Right. Inspired me to say that. Is yeah. I have not done a lot yeah. of that stuff. Yeah. So I've, I've been doing all my voting with how I'm buying stuff. A couple <laughs> things because I there was like a cracker brand that I really enjoyed, and they suddenly started instead of putting it in paper inside the box, they put it in plastic. And so I I wrote to them, and the same with a, a vegan cheese that I was buying. It was in a cardboard box, and then they with it wrapped in. Um, uh, wax uh, and then or, or wax paper and then they started putting it in plastic and then they explained to me that it was because of food waste and I was like oh. yeah they yeah, were like they I were getting pulled off the shelf because it was getting going rotten oh right right so there was a lot of food waste so I was like okay so, like, I won't even though the potatoes might be in a smaller bag and they're you know I'll buy the local potatoes if I'm at like yeah. you know fresh water fields but I'll buy the one without the plastic yes in the bag yes you know they yeah, are overwhelmed by the trends. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, it gets so overwhelming, all these trends all the time. Even with the being all like looking pretty with the zero waste stuff, it's all trends, right? But I feel like, yeah, it definitely starts with individual action. Um, like if you produce less garbage, there's less, less garbage to be thrown out. It's just, I think that, yeah, 
I just want to comment on the community piece, and I think that part is really important. Like when you shop at the market, you end up engaging with people and talking to people. Like you were saying, when you walk through the neighborhood, you talk to people. And how we've come to this place now in society where we don't feel comfortable even going and knocking on the neighbor's door for sugar. You'd rather get in your car and drive to the store because you don't even know the neighbor's name because you've never interacted with them. Mm -hmm. And so we've lost community right along with this, yeah. this mass consumption of everything. Community has gone down with it. And I think by coming back to those conversations and being out in the community and then you start learning and then it starts creating awareness which then changes those votes. And I think all of that really does stem from these sorts of conversations. Yeah, my kids joke with me and I roll a lot because when we go out walking, like we never go out somewhere that I don't stop and talk to someone and they're like, oh my gosh, you know that too. <laughs> <laughs> and we have to stand here while you talk to them. Mm -hmm. like, like it's, uh, everything's a lecture with you. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna ask, you were talking about you know, reaching the younger generation and I, I didn't realize that, you know, Heather, you spoke to my kids' girl guy group but then that was you and not every other people talking and then I was the pasta mom at a middle school and so I remember getting the pasta in the reusable. Yeah, that was my husband. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, and so, yeah. so they were exposed to that so the kids you know kindergarten and grade eight were exposed to that type of um, you know option which was just really awesome but then again I look back and I'm like it's still two people, how can it be 50 people, right? <laughs> you know, does Heather have to go to every single girl <laughs> You know? <laughs> that kind of Sign us up. Yeah. I think that they need, the same way as we get overwhelmed by the trends, they need to change the trends because people listen, like people will look to the celebrities, they will look to what's trending right now on TikTok, especially young people or the teenage that, uh, age that you were talking about. And I feel like, yeah, they're just not doing enough from a government point of view and just like, I think, you know, yeah, yeah, like it, it, materials that are not made with plastic, that are made from, I don't know, like plantain leaves or something, should be made available. I don't know why they're not. And the ones that are, that are like organic, hemp, this, that, it's, they're being so, the margins, like it's just so expensive, people can't afford it. Question for all of all of you, but really for all of us. When you saw the notice from Shannon about this this gathering, and when you signed up for it, what were you hoping to get out of it, and how can you get more of that right here in this room? What needs, what wants, what desires have we not brought up that you would like? Um, well, a few years ago, didn't Grant have a Facebook page that he started where he was uh, sharing things like, this restaurant will let you use your own container and that sort of thing? Does that Facebook page still exist? Probably not, eh? Is that, is that I stop being a counselor we, that we cover right. all the time? Okay. Because I think that having some kind of, uh, like specifically for Orangeville, you know, we are a, a, a small enough community that we can do that, and, and knowing where you can go to, not, like Bruna, you posted a couple things on social media that, you know, told me that, okay, at Greystones, you can bring your own cup. Oh, yeah. Local you know, that's just one little example, but knowing that, like, I will support the businesses that let me do that. For sure. For sure. So, you know. I would be happy to have a chit chat with, there is such a, a one Facebook page that I think would be perfect for that, and I'm sure that the person who runs it would be happy to do it. Um, it's Grassroots Eco. Um, oh, Shannon. Yeah, yeah Shannon. And yeah, she does a, a mobile refillery, which opened slightly before the, the village refillery, and also talked me off a ledge during COVID. <laughs> um, but you know, it was you know it was really important. So um, uh, and it works out of her home and does a mobile refillery. So um, grassroots would be a great um, resource. And she has a Facebook page called I think it's called Eco Conscious Community Orangeville or something of that sort. I, I should that. probably. Do you want to look it up? <laughs> I think we're both on it, but because I've been posting this on it and stuff, so I, I, I am quite sure she'd be happy for people to share things on that page. Yeah. 
mission yeah. is a small business. Definitely, community. it's definitely community, like like our yeah. area. Because right, we're we're a community here right now, and yeah. if, you know, one of us finds it some new thing that we can all do. Then Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. For I sure. would love to be able to develop some kind of app. I would love for the town, like if the town could get a little more involved with, you know, because we are, like, if we start paying attention how much garbage is being put out for for people that come to the refillery, they will make a, it will make a difference. I know because it does for me and everyone that comes in, they're like, oh my gosh, since I started coming here, we barely put any recycling. We don't really have much garbage. So I would love to know the impact and be able to know the impact that it's actually doing mm -hmm. to our local landfill and to the family, mm -hmm. you know, households and stuff. It would help us too, but yeah, so if anybody can develop anything. Orangeville and the Area Eco Conscious Community yes, on Facebook. Sorry, I got this Orangeville track. and Area Eco Conscious Community on Facebook. So that would be a, a good one if you're on Facebook. And then just to, um, what was that? Was, oh, yeah, I have to tell a funny story about the reducing of waste because last um, summer we're still doing pretty well with not putting the garbage out, and we must have a new garbage person. Because last summer, it was, I don't know, week six, week seven, week eight, we hadn't put any garbage out. And um, the lady who drives the garbage truck actually came and knocked on our door. <laughs> and she said, hi, like, I noticed you haven't put your garbage out. And I wondered, like, you know, are you okay? Or, like, you know, <laughs> you know, it's Tuesday, you know, so. <laughs> I thought it was hilarious because like no, we literally don't have enough to put out. So you know, after six or seven weeks, when the garbage man is wondering where you are, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just wondering. I sorry, I'm new to all of you, and I don't know your different um, businesses. And but I just was wondering um, when you're when you were thinking about your home, like I'm thinking soon I might need a new heater. Does anybody have like a heat pump I understand they're better or things like that, like uh, things I can do within my home to reduce the gas emissions and all that, but natural gas lowering it. Um, I can put you in touch with a guy that'll do your whole, whole house on uh, solar. On solar? Yep. Oh wow. And you won't pay a penny, and the, you can put the meter is reversible. So in the summertime, when you get, while the sun comes in, it um, it puts a credit onto your meter. So then in the winter time, if you are using anything from the grid um, because there's less light or less sunlight, you're probably paying from the credits you built up in the summertime. Yeah. But he uses heat pumps, so he'll he'll do the whole deal. And right now, the federal government have got a huge. Uh, grant program going. It's uh, zero interest loans, but it's it'll pay you back over four or five years. Is it high enough for solar? <laughs> well, he does the whole combination. Roof? Like I have a small. <laughs> well, you don't just you don't have to go on the roof if you have access. No, I don't have. Okay. Uh, again, he'd have to make that. Uh, right. Who is he? He he's out of Toronto. His name. Is, um, what do you think on that? Yeah. <laughs> I understand. Yeah, he's, uh, he's way down the road on conversions. He, he did the, uh, you know the trailer park up at Primrose? Okay, oh, on, on Highway 10, just oh, before Highway 10. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's done their whole place, um, completely over solar, heat pumps, uh, the recycling their waters, and the green waters and everything. It's, it's phenomenal. Money for savings is phenomenal. That's how we do it. At home, that's how we do it. We use the we reuse the water, mm -hmm. um, yeah, gray water, and then we have compost, a compostable toilet, and we have a couple of heat pumps. But yeah, it's like so. Um, it's just you know sometimes like especially during the winter if you have any issues or anything, you have a couple of generators. But mm -hmm. it's yeah, it's good. Are there, are there any other unmet needs or? Things you want to, to talk about or raise? Well, now there is. When I go walking my dog through the conservation areas, a lot of people use those and they toss their beer cans away. So I pick up their beer cans, pull the rings off to give to Legion, who get those for wheelchair donations. 
take the beer cans and any wine bottles that I may have and take those over to the uh, animal shelter yeah. and they take all those to help us at their cost for food and all that stuff for the animals they have. Oh, um, the dog walking thing made me think of something. This I, I, I'm not a dog owner, so I don't know, but uh, one of the things that you can notice if you're on the trails is little boot bags all the time. So I have a friend who has a dog and is zero waste or trying to live a zero waste problem. He made a contraption called a poopinator. <laughs> he took an old water bottle that he got from a thrift store and he attached a little scoop to it. And so he takes this water bottle with him, it's got a little hook on it, he takes this like big wide mouth water bottle and he scoops the poop and he takes it home and he flushes it. <laughs> so you don't have to use the poop bags. <laughs> So there you go, if anyone wants a poopinator. <laughs> we use, yeah, we use uh, like bread bags and those types of bags. That you're already, yeah, that we are. already going to throw yeah. in the garbage. That's yeah. another yeah. another good option. But again, just little zero waste things that are lower waste yeah. or, you know, don't buy poop bags. Use ones that you already are going to throw away. And don't forget, it doesn't have to be um, like a specific style of bag. Like it could be the inner lining of the cereal. Right. right, you're gonna throw that in the trash anyways, right? So use that. But anyway, just to little, get the little tips. Stop coming. <laughs> <laughs> have you phoned and it hasn't stopped coming? Oh, the newspaper call. Yeah, you just call. Like, and say, I haven't had paper delivered in really? ten years. Yeah, yeah. we don't have ours anymore. I guess. Okay, oh, so that's one thing. No, they have a list, <laughs> right? They have a list. So if you get if they if it changes over and it's a new person right. or someone's yeah. like you know doing it for them when they're on vacation, you're still gonna get it. Mm -hmm. But in general, I think I've only got like. I want to say five papers over the last ten years. And if you have a lot, you can always uh, bring it over. I Use it for that. fires. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. Shannon, I'll give you this contact information. Sure, and I'll company. pass it out. Okay. Can I do that with the mail too? <laughs> yes. Put yeah. So you put a note on your mailbox I that try. says that you only want addressed mail. Right. I could just do that myself because yeah. I tried it before and I. You can't, that, in that case, you can't, it has to be like visible on your mailbox. Yeah. Like you can't contact. Or inside. On the front. On the front. Oh, on the, on the outside. Yeah. On the outside. Yeah. Oh. Even if you're in a community. Not, like, even if you're in a community, box. you tell your letter carrier and they put little red dots inside your mailbox and you don't get any junk. Awesome. You so only get addressed. I don't my sign once in a while because it fades and yeah. then or they forget if it's someone new or just you know no unaddressed mail well, and sometimes they change the rules for a while there was a specific statement you needed ah or you just move off grid and don't tell anybody <laughs> 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 around the sides and back are, are some resources uh, resource books suggested by these and Pulled out also ones by Shannon. That need to be checked out before you go. <laughs> <laughs> if you have other suggestions of, of books that or resources that you found useful, make sure you tell Shannon about it or tell us now, and Shannon will get that. Um, let's take the last couple of minutes just to talk about quotes or aphorisms that, that you use to advantage. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. Love it. <clears throat> Orangeville has tree planting twice a year, in the spring and the fall. We just had the spring one. Some of us were there. <laughs> uh, feel free to come out every year. We had a great turnout this year, but sometimes nobody shows up. I plant Where a lot of trees. Where is that advertised? Town website. 
one doesn't often go on the town website. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the counselors are the very least they supposed. I don't know. Test gets posted a lot. Test gets posted a lot. I, I know at this point. So you I'm can sure. sign up to receive town newsletters, and then I it might be. A, indicated in the newsletters of what's coming out oh, okay. or even subscribe to the town's calendar on their website credit valley yeah. conservation it's on their event list as well yeah. they, they are part and part of they're the ones yes who so they won't give you an email but if you go into their events that's where you have to okay. register got it, got it. Thank you. it's usually the weekend closest to earth day and i believe the weekend before thanksgiving okay every day <laughs> That is my. That was going to be mine. <laughs> Every day is Earth Day. It's one of my little. Any other yes. little nuggets? Oh no, I don't have a nugget. I had a question. Go for it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I've made some mistakes in my life around environment, which I have to figure out how to undo. But what I'd like to do this summer is rip out my lawn and plant. I don't want a lawn, and I was picked up on what you don't, said. You don't need a lawn. Don't need a lawn. Don't, don't need want a lawn. lawn. I'd like flowers, so and shrubs and ground cover. So you just cut the grass out and start planting. What's the bylaw? Does anybody bylaw know? Oh yeah, there is no bylaw okay. that says what you can or cannot do with your front lawn, except for you're not allowed to have a composter mm -hmm. on your front lawn. You can rent an old grass cutter, so it cuts the grass like in sod rolls and you roll it up, give it away so that so somebody will buy your sod. Okay. Also, I don't know if you've heard, it's called like lasagna gardening where you put yeah. down like cardboard and then you put the soil on top and it just kind of like kills off the grass underneath. Yeah, because really the idea of my whole front yard is now like a vegetable garden. So, so cardboard. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just like cardboard, layer it all down and then soil on top and then mulch it. So much soil. Yeah, it's a couple inches and then I kind of like will disintegrate the cardboard and the grass. Yeah. And you can plant right through the cardboard. Like yeah, you can break exactly. through the cardboard when you plant it. Yeah. I think you'd be so. I don't know what you use. But uh, I, I'm fully going to admit that we had 2,000 square feet of gout weed on our property. And oh, for wow. some of it that was in the sun, we put black plastic on it. Okay. And it stayed there. It was yeah, very ugly. Yeah, so there you go. People guessed. Were we putting it in a swimming pool? <laughs> 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 like, um, I, think, I think I might know where you live now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, you probably do. Everyone knows the black gap. Yeah, because yeah, it stayed there for like two years. <laughs> you can plant right through your grass. What you have to do with it is then spend time weeding. More time weeding and reducing competition around what you plant. You don't have to remove the grass. Okay. It's not as bad as the gout weed. <laughs> it would be amazing though if people were growing food right on their front lawn and things like that. Oh, like uh, uh, I mean, I, I think you have so some food cool. on your front yard, don't you, Matt? Yeah, yeah, I have kale. Uh, a couple years ago I had pumpkins. Yeah. Cool. I they, they spread a little bit. I don't really have a backyard. Like I have this weird L-shaped lot on the corner and so we have our vegetable beds up front and my favorite thing about it, I'm actually only like a mediocre vegetable gardener at best. I sometimes get good yield and sometimes don't. But it's an educational thing, right? The daycare groups go through and you walk, you'd listen to the teacher point out all of the you know, different the things raspberries. that we're growing and then we have raspberries right along the sidewalk. No, you don't. No, she doesn't grow raspberries. <laughs> I do and we share. <laughs> and we share with everyone walking by. All the kids on the way home from school have a snack. There's going to be a new community outside your uh, house now. <laughs> People are so... People are so embarrassed when we catch them, catch them, celebrate them. They come out and they're eating raspberries. <laughs> but you don't put something right along the sidewalk if you don't want to share. <laughs> Which goes to the, you have to also play your strengths because I cannot make anything grow unless it begs me for food when it's hungry. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> my children are fine, but plants, <laughs> not so much. Only so. outside, right? So I, I, need, I need help. I appreciate other people and neighbors who, who grow food because, you know, I cannot do that. <laughs> so if you or anyone, we're, we're embarking on higher raised garden beds that are about the size of a great period. So, um, so, <laughs> so how do you, what's the bottom? Like, what do you do with the blocks? Do you put rocks? Do you put cardboard? Do you put, like, how do you layer your... 
like raised beds. beds. So they're not on legs, they're just long. really, really tall? No, no, it's 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 on the ground, so the box is gonna be on the ground. But you can't just put the wood straight on the ground. So what do you what Why do you have a bottom then? Well it wouldn't have a bottom. But but what would be the like would I put I can I can fill in with this. My one. dog is gigantic, and she's a she's a digger, so everything has to go up. She <laughs> Yeah. Oh yeah. god. Yes. I thought you were making. I thought it was a metaphor of how yeah. no, how tall it was. I need a box this high. <laughs> if but I, but I'm, I'm trying to think. Oh, about what how, to fill it with? How to fill it with? Is it like should it be tons and tons and tons of soil, or is oh, it? Oh. You can use logs. You can use large sticks. Or the other thing you could do, if I mean, if you really want to spend money and kind of over-engineer it, you kind of have a false bottom. You, yeah. you somehow, I don't get, say, you pressure treat plywood or something, and you only make it this deep, essentially. Or you just, yeah, make like a, a large table that's that's raised. You don't necessarily need to fill this deep of soil. Right. Right. You only need to, you only need this much soil, really. Right. So you can make a you know a or large that. table that's just tall that's yeah. you know this deep, <laughs> depending on what you want to grow with. It yeah. all depends on what you want to grow. So I guess as well. the concern is like, how much soil do you put in it, or you don't need to fill in all the soil. Wet. For sure, you know, the, the wood's getting wet. Should it should it not be sitting on the top of something if the grass is wet or whatever? No, I'm just, I'm my just beds saying. are right on the ground. Okay. Yeah, mine too. Mine too. So yeah. I put down a layer of cardboard on the grass. The grass doesn't really grow great on my property anyway because I have a lot of shade. Um, so I've put the beds in the only places that are a little bit sunny, and um, I just put. Cardboard, and, but but mine are only between this and this. Mm -hmm. I would definitely not fill it with that much. No, I'm, I'm trying to avoid that, but then it, I don't want it to disintegrate because it's yeah. sitting wet. It's just, no, she could admire to keep you talking about it. True. Could you keep a hay bale? <laughs> no, we haven't. We're, we're just, we're still oh, it's true. We're still yeah. interesting. Which right. Is, yeah. <laughs> it eventually will like, break down. It but will, but you, it kind of probably would be good straw. for the soil, too. The straw, yeah. 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 Like a straw bale? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we've been breaking and cleaning up the property, so we're saving all that stuff to put in it. Um, but I'm just curious, like, people obviously have more experience. Did you build could. them or did you buy them? Uh, we will be building them. Okay. Yeah, I have a garage full of um, pallet skids, which I now think are not appropriate, so I now have a garage. <laughs> so I'm going to thank you for coming, and I'm going to thank you for doing, and Shannon for organizing, and point you towards all the resources. Yes, thank you.